Imagine the awesomest thing you can, like an automatic grilled cheese maker, or a time machine, or a time machine with an automatic grilled cheese maker. Now imagine who's going to invent it. Him? Glasses here? Whoever they are? Or maybe her? But how do kids like these become the types of people that do things like this? Maybe we should ask this guy. Knowledge is heavy. Sometimes it's a limit to, to have new ideas. That's the problem with the old schooling, because they were teaching answers. I believe questions are probably more important today than the answers. Erno's cube is a question waiting to be answered. And when the right person finds the right question, something amazing happens. They start seeing the world as it truly is. Not a place to be memorized, but a place to be figured out, flipped, turned, twisted, and ultimately made better forever. Today, she may be an octopus, but help kids like her fall in love with problem solving, and they will embark on journeys to become scientists, artists, engineers, designers, inventors, or something no one's ever been before, but you can bet we're gonna need. That's why moments like this, go, and this, and this, and especially this, are so important. Because there are companies to found, planets to walk on, time machines to invent, a future to be made amazing. We may not know what it's going to look like, but we know who's going to do it. Just give answers all day. 
We ask a lot of questions and we problem solve. That is the work skill, not just giving an answer back. Um, and so you're right, there are, two, there are two components, but you need content knowledge, you need information. Excellent. Other implications for our students, given this world? I think uh, having students be able to know how to evaluate information that's coming at them, because it's coming from so many different sources, and how do you know how much to, to trust it, and so asking the right questions about that is very important. Absolutely, the ability to analyze the massive amount of information that comes at us in such quick bursts, and, and in, you know, we get a lot of our information too in so many characters, that's not a whole story. So that ability to analyze and evaluate what you're getting is extremely important. Other thoughts, yes? Uh, the importance of collaboration among students, not one person has all the answers, but together problems can get solved. Absolutely, how many of you have to work with other people in your jobs? in your families, <laughs> you know, that's, that's right. Collaboration is something that we all have to do. And more and more, our students are going to need to be self-starters in that collaboration. How many people in here work from home or telecommute? Right, so our daughter, who's 22, got her first job just after she graduated in the spring, and she has a job where she can work from home. But she has to be very disciplined and still connect with all the other people. And she said, for the first time in my life, someone isn't telling me what to do all the time. But more and more of our students are going to need to be able to work in those environments. So take one more. Something else that you think this, there's an implication for educating kids today because of the world that we're living in. Sure. The tools to be able to create something that actually doesn't that creativity, that innovation, that entrepreneurial spirit um, is really important. There's a researcher named Yang Zhao. He's from China. He grew up in China. He says, I went to school in China. We don't want to be China. But he is a researcher and he's, out, he's an educator at Oregon. And he talks about, he wrote a book called World Class Learners. And in that book, he talks about the importance of our students being able to invent because they're going to need to invent their work. Artificial intelligence is taking jobs that used to exist. Now that's not something to wring our hands about because there's nobody at the phone company connecting our calls anymore either. But some jobs are going to leave and we're going to need our students to be creators and inventors of, of whatever is next. We don't even, as, a, as the film said, there'll be things we don't even know about yet. So those are some pretty big implications for education. And that's why we have a strategic plan. <laughs> that's why we have a strategic plan. Because we know that we need to educate our kids to be thinkers and problem solvers and innovators. And we can't do that hoping that without a plan we'll get there. If we know we want to achieve a, a specific outcome for our kids, specific knowledge, skills, and mindsets, then we need a plan to get there. You don't decide to go on vacation and not have a plan for how you're going to get there. What, what we've done in Bexley is some really, really great things. And about 15 years ago, the district identified, or each building identified a separate best practice. And that was great at that time, but the landscape has changed and what we need to do has changed. I talked about 15 years ago, the decisions that were made educationally, which have been in place up until this year. The iPhone was invented in 2007. We've had the same plan in place longer than we've had an iPhone. So we have to adjust. It doesn't mean we get rid of everything that's working, but we have to keep adjusting because we're educating kids for something different. And we don't want to just hope we get there. We want a plan to be successful. And that's why we developed a strategic plan, is to make sure that we align our resources to an outcome that we're trying to accomplish. So what was our process? to get here, and I'm, this part I'm gonna go pretty quickly because I wanna get into the details of the plan. From March to May, we did research, and I wanna credit our Board of Education, and Marley Snowden is here, Mike Dennison is here, and Michelle Minio is here, and Michelle was our board member who was on our strategic planning team. But our Board of Education recognized we need a plan of action to accomplish the goals that we have for our kids, and we need to identify what those are going to be. And so we started this process with the Board of Education being interviewed. Each of them gave individual hour-long interviews to um, the firm that we hired to help us do this because we didn't want 
this to be just random. And when you do, how many people have been through strategic planning? Okay, you know, I can't do the strategic plan. I can't do run the focus groups. You need that outside person who isn't personally invested in order to get honest information. And I work here, so even though I was new last year, the fact that I work in the district, I have a certain view and a certain perspective. So we wanted to make sure we really had a thorough process. So we started with our Board of Education. Then we had focus groups. We held nine focus groups. Students, staff, parents, and community members. We invited over 300 people to participate in one of nine focus groups. And I'll be honest, we started with eight, and what we realized was we had a, a demographic in our community that we had not gotten into one of our focus groups. So we added to make sure that we had a comprehensive uh, look. We did surveys. We sent surveys to over 3,000 people, all six through 12th grade students, every staff member, every parent, and 750 non-parent community members. So we wanted to make sure that we had a lot of input. And what we did in those focus groups and the surveys is we asked, what does Bexley Schools do really well? And where are there opportunities for growth? And the plans really build around those opportunities for growth. Again, maintain what we do well. And then where do we need to grow for the future that we're trying to build for our kids? We also did some external analysis. What are the best systems out there doing. We looked at what other districts are doing. We looked at what the other companies are doing. We looked at research. So we gathered tons of information to craft this plan. In addition, in, in uh, June, we had an open community meeting. And I think some of you were there. I recognize some faces. And we had this open community meeting, and we did a final same questions. Here's what we have so far. Collected a few hundred post-it notes. And what we found was we weren't getting any new information. So after that meeting, we knew we've gotten all the information that we need to start to make some decisions. And so we took all that information, and from May to August, we worked on developing our plan. And this included, again, our Board of Education, our strategic planning team, our administrative team, all of the data that was gathered, we started saying, what are the things that rise to the top? Where are the, the, the themes that, are, if you've ever done qualitative research, themes start to emerge? And there were themes that definitely emerged. And from that, we developed our new mission, vision, and values. And if you picked up a palm card, um, you can see on the back, these are our kids. It's always great to see our kids on everything. Um, we developed a new vision statement. And it is Bexley, exceptional education for today and tomorrow. We want every child to have an exceptional experience that propels them to the future. We have the, the term today and tomorrow for two reasons. One, we want to make sure we're providing that exceptional education today, and we want to be flexible enough to change and grow for tomorrow's. It also is about our students. We want them to have an exceptional experience while they're with us, and then take that exceptional experience into their tomorrow's. So that's our vision. That's, where, that's what we aspire to do for every student. Our new mission statement is to provide educational experiences that engage, equip, and empower each student. First, we have to engage students in learning. They have to come into the classroom excited. If I could maintain the excitement of kindergartners until high school graduation, which they're about as excited on graduation day as they are on kindergarten, we have some elementary teachers. What, how do kindergarten children go to school? How do they go to the building? They're excited. They're excited. They run. They run to school. If you go to high school, it's not usually running, you know? <laughs> They're tired. Um, but they run to school. They can't wait to get there. They're engaged. And if you've got, I've ever been in a kindergarten classroom, and I'm lucky I get to go hang out in any classroom, which is really cool for me. But I was recently in a kindergarten class sitting on the floor, and literally every kid is coming and sitting and giving me a book and wants to read a book. They're engaged, they're, they're curious. We want to maintain that the entire time the kids are with us. So we have to get them engaged in things. Go back to the video. We don't want to focus on answers, we want to get them focused on questions. Okay, and we'll come back to that. We need to equip them, content knowledge. They need to be able to read. They need to have numeracy skills. They need to be able to have scientific problem solving skills. They need to develop artistic skills. They need content knowledge. 
okay, and skills that are academic in, in nature. So we have to equip them with that information, and then we want to empower them. We want them to feel confident that they can leave us and accomplish goals that they have set for themselves. We also want them to know they can accomplish things while they're with us. Our kids do some great things. I'm looking at the principals in the room who all have kids who just do amazing things. I just learned, some of you probably know this, we have two, or one former and current student who grow the hottest peppers in the world or something like that. They have a whole business. That is so cool. But we want to make sure that we're in, empowering lots of kids to do those kinds of things, not just not just a few. So that's our, that's our mission. That's our work every single day. Engage, equip, empower. And we want everyone to know those terms. We want, that to, we want our mission statement to be what really guides us on a daily basis. We've even talked about with staff. We have to engage, equip, and empower our staff. And we have to engage, equip, and empower our parents. Um, you, asked, you talked about some of the changes and things. So how do we help parents to, to be part of this journey and this process with us? And then we identified core values. Again, this is all coming from this, all the thousands of data points that we gathered do, during the research process. These are not in any order except alphabetical, because we don't believe that any one of these is more important than the other. First, we value improvement. We can't talk about today and tomorrow if we're not willing to change and keep improving. We have to value constant improvement. And a focus on improvement is not because we haven't been good, but the very best organizations, the most elite teams, constantly seek to improve. I always talk about Jordan Spieth. He's a great golfer. What does he practice? Golf. <laughs> he doesn't say, I'm a great golfer. I'm not going to work on that anymore. The, very, the best and the brightest seek to constantly get better. That's what we believe in as a school district. <coughs> Inclusiveness. We are a diverse community. We have diverse students, and we value that. We want to make sure that each student who comes to school feels included and valued every day, as well as our staff and our families. Individuality, that's very similar, but you know, including, but also valuing what makes us different. It's great, we have to find out what makes us the same, but what makes us different? What are our individual differences that, that strengthen and enrich our experiences? And we value that as a district. Innovation, we've already talked about that. We value innovative teaching methods. We value innovative learning spaces. We value innovative ideas about how to maximize our, our financial resources. We want to be innovative. Um, that's the world that our kids are going to go into. Inquiry. I said we have to value questions as much as answers. Uh, one of the things I said we're going to keep the things that we've had in the past. We've had international baccalaureate in a couple of our buildings. International baccalaureate is really built upon the value of inquiry. That's so important to us, we said that's a core value. That's how important questioning is to us, and we want to promote that for all of our kids. Integrity, I think that goes without saying. We want our kids to be good people, good students, good people. We want them to be honest, we want them to take responsibility for their actions, we want them to be respectful, disagree respectfully, and with kindness, we think those things are really, really important. And finally, investment. We want to invest in our students, we want to invest in our staff, and you'll see that in one of our themes. How do we invest in our own people? Because our work is, is the, the product, the education, comes through people. And if we don't invest in our staff, they can't provide the very best education to our students. So that's certainly important to us. From the data, in addition to the mission, vision, and values, four themes kind of came up as those things around which we should build our plan. The first was to build upon a student-centered learning culture. Bexley has always been focused on students and excellent education. But what does student-centered learning look like today? It looks different. It's more about students setting their own goals, students starting to monitor their own progress, developing experiences for individual students. That doesn't mean that the math teacher teaches 25 different lessons. But kids may have different goals. How many of you in your work or somewhere in your life have set goals in your job? And could those be different from your coworkers? Sure. Same with our kids. Now, you also had some common goals for your company or your organization, but you also had your individual goals. And we want to we make sure that we're doing both of those things for our kids. We want to open doors that lead to flexible, expansive future opportunities. There's more than one pathway to success. One of the things we heard loud and clear in the data gathering phase was that kids need to know all the different options. 
The only pathway to success is not a four-year college. And I'm not anti-four-year college, I just finished a doctorate. I've been on a lot of four-year colleges, okay? But that's not necessarily the right pathway for every student, and it's not the only successful pathway. And this is not about, well, I'm not sure you're doing so well, so we'll give you these other options. It's making sure every student knows all the various options that are out there. I was just talking to one of our parents today who has a college freshman, and he was saying to me, he doesn't know what he wants to do, and it's like, you know, we were talking about some things that you'll hear from me soon. It's like, I wish we would have had that. And he said, you know, they just, kids just don't know all the options that are out there. And he was like, Chris, this is a highly supportive parent. But that's true. Students still know about five or six jobs. I can be a doctor, I can be a lawyer, I can be a teacher, I can be an engineer, I can be an you know, accountant. They don't really have a lot of knowledge of all the various jobs that are out there. I had a colleague in Dublin whose brother repairs MRI machines. It's a very lucrative job, apparently. Um, have you ever tried to hire an electrician or a plumber? Really hard to get those people. So there are lots of opportunities for students. We need to make sure they know those. And the students, this is one that the students actually, I have a student advisory group and they talk to me about this one. Um, we want to leverage and grow our vital community relationships. We want to make sure that we have partnered with people in our community who can help us to offer experiences to our kids. They can't learn everything in a classroom. So where, how do we partner to provide experiences that benefit, hopefully, our, our, our community, but also benefit our students in terms of their learning? And finally, we want to develop a high-performing team. That's that investment in our staff. For our professional development day last week, that's an investment in staff. Sometimes parents go, why do my kids have to be off school that day? Because our staff has to learn. The educational landscape is vastly different. And I don't want to be negative, but I started my day at one of our buildings the other day where we're having some, some kiddos who are needing some extra supports. And on my way back to my office, there was a nationwide, anyone work for nationwide children's? Okay, so I can make sure I get my number right. But I believe that the advertisement said that one in five children in Franklin County are suffering from mental illness. I don't know if that's, it was a high number. Not my area. Not your area, okay. <laughs> I think it was one in five. I believe it. I believe it too. We have nationwide children's counselors to do mental health counseling in our buildings. We are adding one so that we will have a full-time counselor for high school and a full-time for middle school at no additional cost to the district. That's part of just our work with nationwide. That, when we, three years ago, four, we're gonna place on, four years ago, we didn't have that in our schools. I would say five, six years ago, most schools didn't have that. Now everyone's scrambling. Our school, our kids are different. The educational landscape has changed. So in addition to the rapidly changing environment, the mental health needs of our students are different. We know about more um, learning disabilities today than we knew about five or two years ago. This is my 30th year. The world of education has changed drastically in the last 30 years. And so we have to invest in our staff in order to meet the needs of the kids that are coming to us. All right. So those are our mission, vision, values, and our themes. All of our plan is designed around those four themes. Okay, so that's what I'm going to get into, and there's a process we're going to follow. Um, I am going to review each theme and its definition, and then I'm going to get into the three-year objectives, the three-year growth indicators, and the annual goals. And after each of those, I'm going to give you about a minute to talk with the people around you. If you have a note card and you have a question, I want you to write the, your question on the note cards. Okay? And we'll collect those a little bit later. Does that process make sense? So you, have be, you have to be involved again. All right? Okay, so our first theme is building upon a student-centered learning culture. Um, if you picked up this paper, I don't want to read to you, but if you picked up this paper outside, then this has all of the same information on it. So what do we want to do? We want to create an expansive teaching and learning opportunities in an engaging and safe environment to achieve exceptional results K-12. We want to develop internal and external assets to promote learning on a path to holistic growth and wellness for each child. That's a lot. <laughs> we could stop right there and have a really, really big plan. Okay, but we want to think about what do we need to do in a holistic environment, but also how do we have internal and external factors that help us. So we have, this looks a little different than yours. 
what are we headed toward? We developed this plan to be a three to six year plan. So we wrote it for three year objectives, knowing that at the end of three years, we could expand and keep those same themes for another three years. So it's three to six. We'll have to assess where we are. Remember I started with rapidly changing world? You can't make a 10 year plan today. So a three year plan is probably about as much as we can do. Um, but knowing we could go a little farther. So where do we want to be in this particular area in three years? Um, we want to build and utilize the student success profile as a foundation for learning. We want, so I talked about knowing where we want to go. One of our things, our goals here is to develop that student success profile. Many districts are calling it the profile of a graduate. What are the knowledge, skills, and mindsets that we want each student to have by the time they graduate from Bexley? We want to be really intentional about identifying what those things are, and then we want to make sure we're intentional about developing experiences that lead to it. So again, we don't want to say, this is what we want for kids, and boy, we hope they get there. This is what we want for kids, and we're going to do things that get them there. So we want to, by the end of three years, we have identified our student success profile, and we're using it in our decision making. How will we know when we've gotten there? So we have some growth indicators. We want to cultivate a culture in which we collaborate with students and families to develop a personalized learning and growth plan for each Bexley student. We've already started on this. One of the things we're required to do in the state of Ohio is if we want to, this is some educator, legal aspects of our state, in order to say or claim that we serve a gifted student, we have to write what's called a written education plan. And in the past, we were writing generic plans for all kids, and they weren't personalized. And we said, you know what? Let's slow down. Let's write plans that actually make a difference for students. So this year, we're writing personalized learning plans for each student who's been identified as gifted in the cognitive area. What does that mean? We're not really writing the plans. The students are helping to identify what their goals should be. That doesn't mean they have to decide that they're not taking math. But what do they want to, what are, where they, do you ask kids what they want to get good at or how they want to grow? They know. They're really good at that. And so we've started with that. Our goal is in three years, every student in our district will have written a personalized learning plan. And they will, at the mid-year, give their own feedback as well as get feedback from their, their teachers. And then again at the end of the year. Think about the life success skill. I can set goals, I can monitor my progress, and I can make adjustments to achieve my goals. That's success. You can do those three things. We're going to teach our kids how to do that. It's going to take us a couple of years to get there, but that's where we want to be. So that'd be a growth indicator. Um, and so I'll go across to the goal for this year. Identify, we also want to identify learning and growth goals for each student based on individual needs and strengths. We're writing the personalized learning plans for a group of students, but our teachers are working on looking at data. <coughs> Lots of certain resources to understand where each child is. I sat in what's called a teacher-based team meeting at Montrose Elementary uh, yesterday. And the teachers, these were first grade teachers with a reading specialist and an intervention specialist, and they were discussing the data they had from our new reading program, Foundations, which is our foundational skills, uh, foundational reading skills program. And they were talking about their assessment data and what that meant for different students and what different students need it. And in some, they were saying, I'm concerned about this child, let's do this. And the other thing, I'm saying, I think we need a little more time. And there's a lot of cross-conversation, and the teachers in the audience know exactly what I'm talking about. Really identifying learning goals for individual students, and that's happening across the district. The second indicator of growth would be to address opportunity and achievement gaps to include all aspects of student performance in both extracurricular areas and in the academic areas. We have gaps. We have achievement gaps, and we have opportunity gaps in our district. And that's not a criticism, but we have to be honest about it. Our African-American students, our Hispanic students, our economically disadvantaged students, and our students with disabilities are not achieving at the same levels as some of our other students. And when they have gaps, doors are closing. Remember we said we want to open doors? We have to look at how we address those gaps. But first, we have to identify what are they. We also have gaps and opportunities in some of our arts and extracurricular areas. 
I was really fortunate to be at a conference last week and there was a professor from Vanderbilt who was sharing her research on the lack of diversity in music programs and what she found. So I reached out to her to get her full study so we can learn from that. So we want to make sure not only, so for this year, we need to assess those gaps, then we want to have a plan to do something about it. Because again, this is about each child being successful, not just most of the kids, but each of the kids. Our third growth indicator would be develop social and emotional health literacies, K-12. Again, also including our extracurricular activities because social and emotional health is a whole thing. Does everybody know what social and emotional health is? Okay. So we want to make sure kids have that. I talked about mental health needs of our students. Um, we want to make sure that our kids, um, that we have a plan and that we're building, not just intervening, but we're building those skills and we're building those literacies among our students. How are we gonna do that? For the first year, we're assessing the current state of student social emotional needs and literacies. Um, I've lost my place now. I should just keep reading up here. We're assessing our current state of student social emotional literacies and needs and we're identifying a comprehensive school activity-based solutions, including parent education. Um, Laysan Smith is here. She's our Director of Student Community Engagement. She's been uh, bringing in lots of different companies that help to assess the social and emotional wellness of students, and we have one tomorrow morning. And how many have, have you looked at so far? I looked at three. This will be our second one that we looked at at Right. So, unfortunately, if I go someplace and I hear, I'm constantly sending her texts, and hey, I just saw this new thing, you should look at this. Um, but we really want to not just assume we know where kids are, we want to start with, let's assess where our kids are. What needs do they have? And so we're working on that. And then our, third, our fourth growth indicator in this particular area would be to create optimal learning environments that promote engaging, innovative, and effective teaching and learning. Again, we talked about engaging our kids, equipping our kids, and empowering our kids. What kinds of education, what kind of learning environments do that for students? We want to create those. Um, we want to define and begin to create optimal physical learning environments, which include components of innovative spaces, safety, and security. Pam Glasgow, who's an executive director of the Bexley Education Foundation, is here. They've done a lot of support for our staff on flexible seating and innovative um, learning spaces, and we really appreciate that. The reality, though, is we have old facilities. Our newest building is 70 years old. <laughs> Or about 70 years old. I think that's about right. Somewhere in that 65 to 70 age. Okay, retirement age, right? <laughs> we have great buildings that are well maintained. John Eikenberry here is our business manager, oversees the maintenance and operations of our building. Our buildings are extremely well maintained. If you walk through our schools, they are they're old, but they're maintained. The reality is they are because they're old, they weren't designed for the modern educational needs of students, nor for safety and security. Harley, Dr. Harley Williams is here. He's our Director of Staff and Student Operations. Harley and John have been working together on implementing some procedures and also some solutions to increase safety and security for our students. So that's some of our work this year. Um, but we also want to make sure that we have those innovative spaces. We've um, convened a facilities advisory group. Some of those members are here. Thank you. Um, and we're going to be looking at our facilities and what can we do to, one, address our enrollment growth that we're dealing with, um, we've grown by about 10% in five years, but also, how do we use our facilities and create those spaces that are more innovative? And we have an art teacher here. We would probably love to have a really innovative space. Um, we all would. So, so those are the things we're working on. That's all in that first theme of building upon a student-centered learning environment. So what I want you to do is take a minute. And I'm going to keep to a minute. Talk to the people around you. What did you hear that makes sense? What do you think? Oh, that resonates. That makes a lot of sense for today. I think that's a good thing. What do you have questions about? If you have a question you want to answer, just write it on your card. Okay? So I'll give you one minute. Thank you. 
because we want to answer the question, what should a K-12 math education do for a Bexley student? What should a K-12 art education do for a Bexley student? What are the outcomes that we want? Not, not a hodgepodge of everybody doing something different, and we hope that it all turns out good at the end. We want to make sure we've thought about the process and how are we going to get to that student pro success profile, we've got to be intentional. And so having that curriculum review process that's comprehensive and every five years we're re-looking at every curricular area. Right now we're working, we, this year we're working on a lot, but <laughs> Laura's tired. Um, but we started health. We last um, updated our health curriculum in 2011. That's too long. How much has changed in the world of, of what health and wellness, it's too long. We have to have a process where we do these things regularly. That's that improvement component. Um, we're going to, this year, we're conducting curriculum assessment and development per district curriculum review cycle. So again, this year, and Laura might have to help me, we are, last year we started science, we're finishing science, we're working on health, art, family, super science, family consumer science, physical education, physical education, we said art, music, uh, and theater. And theater, that's a lot. A lot of areas. She's one person. <laughs> She's leading, um, and we, our teachers are are um, really, really important in this process because they are the experts in their content areas. So we're following that process. Um, another indicator of our progress would be to select and implement district-wide instructional leadership and instructional coaching practices. Um, for this year, we're looking to choose instructional leadership and coaching partners to implement instructional leadership and instructional development programs. We've implemented a principal council for our principals, and I'm going to be shameless. My dissertation was on developing principals to be instructional leaders. So I did this work in another district. We've taken what I've learned there and, and the good thinking of the people here, and we've implemented a very um, consistent and systemic program to develop our principals to be instructional leaders. You can't just say, go be an instructional leader. You're not, it's not like a trait you're born with. It's a skill you develop. And we want, we have Jason Cottles here as principal at the middle school, and Brooke Smith is an administrative intern there. They're working together. They can help each other. They can collaborate. We're working on when you go into classrooms and you're observing instruction, what do you see? What feedback would you give? And they're really doing a lot of great collaboration. And they're reading and they're studying. And so we're working on that. We're also looking forward to instructional coaching. Research would tell us that the most effective way to change instructional practice in the classroom is through coaching. How many of you have a child that plays a sport or takes a private lesson? They need a coach, right? They need a coach. It doesn't just, you know, just go out there and play soccer and we'll help you win. It doesn't work that way. You have to have somebody beside you coaching. My son was a wrestler in middle school and high school. And the first wrestling uh, match where he got beat really, really badly. But <laughs> that's what happens when you first start. But when, it was, when his match was over, I watched his coach go over and grab him and pull him up and he's showing him things. And I said to my husband, I said, I think he's a teacher. In fact, he was a special education teacher. The very best coaches know that teaching and coaching are the same. And the way you help teachers to improve is to coach them. Go into the classroom beside them and help them. So we're working on that particular definition. What does that mean? And how do we bring that to our teachers? Our th next uh, growth indicator would be to align and enhance curriculum with innovative teaching models and integrated technologies. So again, how do we bring innovative teaching to our classroom? One is through coaching, but we want to align that with our technology. So we need that technology plan. We also know that we need to equip our teachers in these areas. So we want to identify structures and roles to support innovative teaching models, to assess our current technology knowledge and infrastructure to support innovative teaching. One of the ways that we identify or we supported innovative teaching was our professional development day. We had teachers talking about teaching for teaching for creativity. <laughs> so one of our teachers here who did that. Um, we we had teachers who were talking about problem-based learning. This year, we have sent teachers to the Columbus Museum of Art to learn about teaching for creativity. Emily Reiser is all actually teaches in that program. So she's one of our art teachers. She's at Montrose. She's an amazing asset in our district. And she's out teaching other teachers across this, the central Ohio area how to be creative. And creativity is not just for art teachers. Creativity is for everybody. Because again, we want innovative kids. We have to have, show them innovative practices. So we've done teaching for creativity, and we're going to keep sending people to that. 
We have had a number of our science teachers through our um, science curriculum review do some learning around problem-based learning. So if we want kids to solve real world problems, we need to give them that opportunity in the classroom. And then just today, we actually, we had a group, and this is a full year uh, training, we're sending a group of people to our ESC to work with Harvard Project Zero and to learn about thinking and deep thinking and, and the routines that lead to that kind of creativity. All of those things mesh together and help our teachers to be more of an innovative and student-centered. And then as we develop these, our technology tools, so then how does that come into play? How do we bring technology in to help with our students to be even more creative? How many do you use technology in your jobs? Like everybody? <laughs> what happens if your computer doesn't work? I can't work. I can't do it. What am I going to do? You know, we are so dependent upon technology. And again, we don't want kids using technology just because here, do this worksheet on a computer instead. We want to do something really different with technology that give kids great experiences. Um, we also want to assess, this year, we're assessing our current technology knowledge and infrastructure. We actually started this last year. We did a survey of our 4th and 12th grade students, staff, and parents around how we use technology. I gave all of that to Brad and said, here, you need to make sense of this, which he has. That was part of his interview, was to make sense of that. Um, he's doing a lot of work this year with his team just assessing what's our infrastructure, what can we do with technology, and so that we can then develop systems that will support our teachers. And I think Brad, early on, I think sent out an email and said, what would you like to do and what are you not able to do? I forget, something to that effect. I think you were inundated with this is all the stuff I want to do. We have amazing teachers in our school district. They are amazing and they want to do amazing things for your kids and we're working really hard to make sure they have the ability to do that. All right, that's theme two. That's opening those, because when we do all of those things, we build the skills in our kids to have options as they leave us, okay? Turn and talk to your neighbor, you get one minute. What did you hear that you like? What are you not sure about? What questions do you have? Write any questions you have on your note card. Doing my timer here. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Okay, well, let's, we'll get to that. So let's, I'm trying to, this is a process that takes time. 
uh, we'd have to be here for four hours. But we're okay, we're gonna keep going, but you're right. So here's, so what does innovative teaching look like? So again, traditional classroom, this is pretty traditional. You're in seats facing forward. I'm up here. I'm talking. I'm telling you things, and I'm directing you of what to do. <coughs> Versus walking in and there being problems. And maybe Emily would be great at explaining this, but maybe you walk into the classroom and there are note cards all around the room, and there are a series of problems. And students might move about and pick up different ones, and then form groups, and then they start investigating and they start problem solving. Um, at our middle school, uh, one of our uh, um, teachers, Beth. Um, Beth Bennett, thank you. She teaches an integrated science, math, and design class. And if you were to walk in her classroom, first off, students are all over the place, and they're integrated in their science, their math, and their design, and they're problem solving. And so she's giving them particular problems to solve, and they're building things and trying them out and taking notes and what works and what doesn't. That's a more innovative approach than I'm going to lecture to you, you're going to take notes, there will be a quiz, and we'll have three quizzes, and then we'll have a test. That's traditional. We're looking at giving kids problems to solve. We're looking at asking them to develop their own questions about content and then do research on their own. If you think about it, we're really talking about taking what people don't do until graduate school and doing that with, with younger kids. Um, and so getting into those, those kinds of things. Our professional development day, again, we had 32 sessions that teachers could choose from. And um, some, one of the sessions, and this was put on by some of our nationwide children's counselors, was about trauma-informed care. Understanding our kids, understanding the trauma that some of our students, our, te our teachers may not know that. Until they know some of those things, and then how do you respond to a student, that again is more innovative than just, well, you have to respond to me as the teacher. So it's really shifting the focus to be on the student, and then how do we engage the student in our content. It's, it's not a checklist. Educating kids is not a, you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. It's a mindset shift. This work is really about a mindset shift. From I'm the imparter of information to I'm facilitating experiences. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. Right, well, I understand that that's what you're trying to do generally, but I'm saying when it's a plan for the district, there are things that you are doing. I'll show you more of that. Yeah, that's, yep. that's all you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I would just like to make a comment. I'm a retired Columbus public school teacher, fourth grade mostly. And if you have any skepticism or doubt about all this verbiage up here, we did this in our classrooms and it works. It works with inner city kids. You let kids become involved in the process and define problems, not teach giving you a problem. They can do this. And their thinking is unbelievable. So it's sort of almost a leap of faith that the teacher has to take. Mm -hmm. you, know, you talked about having the blueprint, but I can honestly tell you it works. And the, the, what kids come up with is amazing. It, it really is. It, it, it's just amazing. And you can learn right along with the kids. They taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes? I have a quick question. So um, you said that there were 32 sessions that the teachers could choose to go to. Is there any plan to identify gaps in, in the teachers' kind of backgrounds and, and their comfort zones so that you can identify those and actually help um, direct them to fill those gaps so that they can be more effective? That's a process that the principals go through as, they're, as they go through the evaluation process and as they coach teachers. There also is lots of professional development that happens in our buildings on a weekly basis and a quarterly basis, and our principals really assess that. So. Um, I was having a conversation with one of our principals yesterday about how to support a teacher who has some gaps in a particular area. We were problem solving. What can we do to, to, to support those gaps and develop that teacher? So yes, but it's, it's also very personalized as well. Sure. And that's why we did so many sessions because not every teacher needs the same thing at the same time, just like every student doesn't need the same thing at the same time. They were all, sorry, okay. it's 7.30, but they're also, um, all 32 sessions were aligned to the strategic plan. So, uh, you can learn how to work with students of trauma in six different ways. It wasn't like you either took this session or you did something. I mean, everything was aligned. So right. for the first time out, they had a lot of choice, but everything pointed towards us. A lot of our first year goals is assessing where we are because we haven't had a plan. 
So it's hard to say we're going to do A, B, and C until you've identified where your gaps are. And that's so identifying opportunity and achievement gaps. So one of the ways we'll do that is we're looking at what, one, just our own observations. We're talking with our students, but we're also looking at working with the Kerwan Institute from Ohio State to help us identify where the gaps are. Um, when we talk about um, power instructional instructional leadership, I talked about a principal council. It's a professional development that monthly takes place for principals around the instructional goals we're trying to, to develop. But a lot of it is assessing. We did a survey of our teachers of how have you experienced instructional leadership in your buildings. Not as a criticism of anybody, but we got to figure out where, where we are so we can get better. So a lot of a year one strategic plan is assessment. It's not a lot of we're going to do if we start implementing strategies before we've assessed our current state, we could do the wrong thing. So it's a, there's a lot of assessment going on this year. Um, our, our third theme is to leverage and grow vital community relationships. We want to collaborate and create innovative learning partnerships in education, business, civic, cultural, and philanthropic communities. We want to provide essential resources to offer Bexley students diverse experiences and learning opportunities. That's the definition. So how will we know when we've gotten there? In three years, we hope to build vital relationships to dramatically enhance students' experiences and future opportunities. Students can't learn everything they need to know in a classroom. Just how many of you finished college and got your first job and was like, now I'm really learning? Okay. Every one of us who's a teacher will say, I learned how to teach in my first year of teaching. You don't really learn it in a classroom. Um, so how will we, what are some of the indicators of growth? We'll develop partnerships for college and career exploration and planning. At our high school, we have a college counselor. And we've talked about, and she does career counseling too, but we probably need to expand that a little bit. We don't want to just look at college, but what are, not just, not that we don't want to look at college, but what are the career options? I said a lot of students still don't know all the different career options that are out there. So we want to make sure that we have that in place. We want to create partnerships for diverse learning and service experiences. One of the things that we have a challenge with, because we're small, is we don't get to offer some of the things that some of the larger school districts do, like internships and academies. So I was in Dublin. They have eight academies, engineering, IT, teaching academy, health. They now have aviation. Um, they have a number of academies, and their students spend a half a day, and they do internships. So we don't have, those kids are getting experiences and clear career exploration that we haven't. The conversation I was having with the parent today was a college freshman. He said, if my child had had those experiences, we might be in a different place right now. So we want to make sure we look for those partnerships to start to get our kids those experiences. So how can we get kids out? So maybe you don't take, maybe you take two or fewer AP courses and you go work with a forensic scientist. Or maybe you go work with a, a finance person at a bank. Or maybe you go work with somebody who's an electrician because you want to learn about that. We want to make sure we have opportunities for kids to get out. Um, we want to evolve and strengthen our partnerships with our Bexley Education Foundation and other, um, other organizations to impact a positive student experience. I already talked about our BEF, so many things to impact a positive student experience. They just went through a strategic planning process as well. Our plans are very well aligned, and we know that we have that opportunity to keep growing opportunities for our kids. I talked about the flexible seating. Um, we might go, what's the big deal? Kids, for the most part, sit in school for seven hours a day in a hard seat facing forward. How many of you would like to work that way? You get up, you know. Now, stand-up desks. We have stand-up desks. We can stand up. We can sit down. People sit on balls. They sit on chairs. They sit. So we haven't traditionally given those things to kids. And if you think about our current model of education, it was to, it was to create compliant factory workers. We're still using that model. We've got to change that model. Um, so this year we have one goal that we're working on this year toward that objective, and it's to assess and prioritize our highest impact partnership opportunities and build capacity to build and leverage those partnerships. This year we're really trying to identify who are those partners that we can have. I spoke with the Realtors Group this morning. I think that's a great partnership opportunity. Their BEF, I think this came up last night at, at the meeting, there are different people who are saying, well, wait a minute, I could probably do that. There's probably kids that we could have working with some of our BEF board members. Some of you in this room, probably I've been working with some people in the chamber, but some of you in this room probably work in businesses where you could, could have opportunities for students to work with you and learn some careers and to develop work skills that you can't learn in a classroom. So we want to, this year we really want to identify who are those people. 
All right, move forward. Okay, so one minute. Turn and talk. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Make sure the students are actually, they're not just there hanging out, they're actually doing and learning and developing skills. So that, that's a specific step to take to make this happen. All right, the fourth theme is to develop a high-performing <coughs> team. And that's to develop one unified team that is aligned and focused on a common learning philosophy, a profile for student success, and optimal learning outcomes. This means we would ensure resources, support, and capacity are in place to serve the success of the entire team. One of the biggest changes with this plan is an aligned, focused district. Not alignment to five different plans and then students come together and they all have something different and the philosophies change from building to building. That's very confusing for students. But an aligned, focused plan. You don't, companies do not have every division or every company having a different philosophy and a different belief. You have to have alignment. What are we about? Um, if you've read anything about culture, if you've read anything about leadership and organizations, you know you have to have alignment. When people know what the plan is, they have autonomy within that plan. So we need this high-performing team. That's all, we're all driving in the same direction. I have a son in the Navy, so I use a Navy analogy. It's like being in a fleet. There's a destroyer, there's an aircraft carrier, there are, air, there are aircraft, there are other types of ships, and every one of those ships has a captain and a crew that they have a common mission. And if every ship starts going their own direction, it doesn't get accomplished. Again, then you're just kind of hoping something good happens instead of taking steps to ensure that it happens. And that's what this is about, having that team that's all focused on the same things. 
Um, what would the objective be? We want to invest in the optimal Bexley culture, not the Montrose culture and the Cassingham culture and the high school culture, but the Bexley culture. Students graduate from Bexley City Schools. We want an optimal culture for our entire district because kids move through the system. We sometimes get focused on ourselves as adults and we stay put. Kids are moving, and so it ha it has, the movement has to be building. Growth indicators, aligning our team to common vision, mission, and values with consistency across the district in order to achieve the Bexley learning culture. Um, if you know anything about athletics, you know oftentimes teams will build a culture. I'm reading a book right now called Culture Code, and it's about building um, really great cultures. And one of the, the um, examples is the um, San Antonio Spurs that don't always have, and I'm not an NBA person, but bear with me. <laughs> Our athletic director. What they talked about is they don't always have the very best players, but they have a culture that they work really well together and they're successful. So we want to have that kind of, you're building a culture. We're working this year on developing what is that culture? What do we want that to be? Um, we want to be, we want everyone to be part of developing that. Um, we're going to create knowledge of and commitment to vision, mission, and values to develop that culture. We keep using that language, engage, equip, and empower. Each student, exceptional education, today and tomorrow. We use those terms because that is what we're about and that's how you build culture. Culture is the hardest thing in the world to build and to change. It takes time and language is important. I was an English teacher. Language matters. The words that we use, and a lot of this year is just making sure we're all on that same page. Does anyone know what the previous Bexley vision mission statements were? They were each about 10 sentences long, so you probably don't. We were intentional as we gathered this data to say, let's keep it so that people can remember it, because it's supposed to drive what we do. Um, so that's a lot of our work this year, and we're, we're doing that in lots of different ways. Wristbands, palm cards, signage, we're doing it in lots of ways. Um, I know Jason told me next year at the middle school they're going to they're do work around the core values in those students. We want to build that language in our kids. Um, we want to cultivate a learning environment in which staff and parents are knowledgeable of 21st century learning in order to support student learning goals. As parents, the, again, education has changed. What do we have to help our parents to know? What do we have to help our students to know? One of the things we want to do um, is align parent and staff development to create readiness to achieve a plan. We want to institute a parent institute. Proactive, pre-planned topics that are of interest to parents so we can educate. What does it mean to be twice exceptional? What is college credit plus? What does it mean, what is problem-based learning? What does it mean to have, a, to be gifted in the cognitive area? How do I get my child to understand the difference between starting at a two-year college and going to a four-year college? What's the difference between the ACT and the SAT? Should my child take an ASVAB? What is an ASVAB? <laughs> we have a lot of letters. There are so many topics, and one of the things we want to implement is a parent institute, so parents can say, these are the things I need to understand, so we can not only educate students. If you remember at the beginning I talked about, we want to engage, equip, and empower students, and we have to engage, equip, and empower staff, we need to engage, equip, and empower parents. It's complex. This is very, very complex stuff. It's not simple. And so we know that we're going to need to put some things in place. And a parent institute is one of those. And then also, we've already talked about professional development for our staff. <coughs> Teachers today have so much to know. Look at you, you have a career in education, so we know. And every year it becomes more complex. There are so many things for our teachers to know. One of my challenges, we're still operating on, on an agricultural calendar. And we have so many things to learn and so many things to know. I'm really proud of our Bexley Education Association and our Board of Education for negotiating a contract that gave us some more professional development time with our, with our teachers because we have to help them in order to help kids. So those are some of the things in place. All right, last turn and talk. What, is, what does this say to you? One minute. Yes, I got it, yeah.
infrastructure and knowledge and develop a plan and I also talked about coaching teachers so those are things we don't have that we need to look to to bring in in order to maximize our teachers in order to maximize the experiences for our kids so you're right we're missing some of those things and that's a lot of what this theme is about is building up our team to have not only the resources but the knowledge and skills to deliver something really special to our kids all right, so before I get into this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop out of, how am I gonna do that? I, need to, I may need to go back to the computer. Maybe I can get somebody to go back to get out of this. Because I wanna show you, in addition, okay, so I've given you these three year objectives, three year growth indicators, and the annual goals for this year. Then what we did was we developed strategies. The strategies aren't here because strategies are things we think we're going to do. Okay? We may not do all of them. So the administrative team identified the strategies to accomplish these goals. Then every administrator in the district had to go through the strategies. And what we did was we said, okay, are you responsible for the strategy, accountable, informed, or consulted? I did this in the wrong word. Responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. So race chart. How many of you know what that is? Okay, great. So we're doing this really like project management. So every person, every administrator who is responsible or accountable for a goal and strategy had to develop the action steps that they believe they will take in their building or in their department to achieve these things. And what we have done here is Brad, our tech guy, um, who's also a certified project manager, I said, we gotta figure out a way to project manage this. School districts do not do this. Many school districts do not have a, a strategic plan. I this district didn't have a strategic plan. That's not, again, not a criticism. Very few districts do. The strategic plan becomes test scores. We want more than that. Okay, so if they have a strategic plan, it's very rare to actually manage the project so that you know you're actually achieving your plan. So what we've done is we've used this air table, and I call, I call it Excel on steroids. What did you call it, Brad? A light database. A light database. <laughs> it sounds so much nicer. <laughs> a light database. So you can see in this air table, we, have or we can organize things by theme. So there's the theme. There's the three-year objective. There's the definition. Those are the indicators of success. And that's not, again, I, this is a pretty massive document. Then there are the annual goals that we talked about. Now we can sort it by objectives. Okay, where do we want to be in three years? These are the objectives. Okay, what would the indicators of those success be? Then what theme does that fall into? We could sort by indicators. Okay, what are we going to, we want to look at by indicator. What are we accomplishing? Then we can tie that to theme and goals. Then we can just look at goals. Okay, what are all the goals we have? Then what are all the strategies that we have? So you see a goal. Assess current state of student social emotional literacies needs and identify comprehensive activity. We're going to engage in professional learning to gain knowledge and understanding of the social emotional needs of students in order to set goals for students and academics and extracurricular activities. That happened on our professional development day. That happens monthly. Laysan leads a group called our school climate committee. They do professional development on a monthly basis in every one of our buildings around this type of, of work. Um, 
we have sent, sometimes we send teams of teachers to learn specific things. We, Laysan took a team of people to some training around social emotional literacies. I'm serving as the state superintendent's um, representative to the, dis, to the state's social emotional literacies task force. Um, there's a ton of things that happen to get to that. And then identify methodology to assess our current state. That's a strategy. So in order to get to that, and we already said, Laysan is looking at all different companies that do this work and then bringing them in and having people look at them so we can pick the one that we think will be most important or effective for us. We have measures that we've identified. So what would be the measure? Um, we would have had a plan of action to address the um, opportunity and achievement gaps. We have a master plan. I talked about our facilities. Um, part of having a safe and secure environment is to look at our facilities. So we have a facilities advisory group that we've established. We'll develop a master plan. You'll hear more about that over time. Um, what else? And again, that, those measures can be tied to strategies and to goals. Then you see progress. Well, go ahead and go to the progress monitoring. All right. There's Laysan. So if we look at progress monitoring, go by, go by stakeholder. And just kind of scroll through. So there's Brad. So every person has to report, these are administrators, every administrator in the district has to report their progress on a monthly basis toward the goals and the strategies that they have accountability and responsibility for. And so, so you can, so, so everybody has to put in, so what, let's, so, this is a massive, what, we're showing you this, that's so you can read every detail of it if you really want to, I guess we can get to that. But although some of this gets into, there can be names and things up here, that's why we're going kind of fast, because we have to, to be sensitive. We are not, we did not write a plan that's going to sit on a shelf. We engaged our students, our staff, our parents, and our community in developing a plan, and we are committed <coughs> to implementing the plan and monitoring our progress and making sure that we are achieving the success that we've said we want for our kids. Because at the end of the day, we didn't create this plan for adults. We created the plan for students. This is what students need. It's a lot of work. It would be so much easier to sit back and go, we have really good test scores, we're good. That's not what our kids deserve. And so we created a really bold, comprehensive plan. I've had people say, I can't believe you're taking all that on. This is massive. It is massive work, but our kids need that. They absolutely need us to think about their social emotional development, their future opportunities, their academic skills in the now, to how they're gonna get along with other people. Our staff need us to develop them in order to, to accomplish these goals. Our board is gonna be asked to, to, to make decisions and support actions in order to accomplish these things. Sometimes we're going to reallocate resources. We may not spend money on things that we spent it on before. We may spend it on something different. It does cost money to educate children. We have a $40 million budget. That's our annual budget. And we're going to, we've been honestly spending that money <coughs> absent a plan. Let's spend the money to get to something really good for kids and make sure that we get there. I know, I know some of you are like, I want every detail for the plan. Come see me, I'll pull this out, we'll sit down, we'll talk through it. I, that, we would be here for hours and hours and hours going through every one of these things. And, the, and some of the strategies and action steps change. These are what we think we're gonna do. Sometimes you get down the road and you go, okay, that's not quite gonna work, we're gonna do this instead. Just like you do in your jobs. You may think you're gonna do something a certain way and then you have to switch. Something happens, a resource changes, an event happens that you weren't expecting and you have to go a different direction. But the big, it's really not even a big picture, it's, Themes, objectives, indicators, goals, strategies, action steps, lots of stuff. It's good though, it's really, really good work. And as I said at the beginning, we have a lot of momentum in our district. Um, I heard Brooke saying, before, when she was teaching last year, she said, we just kind of were like, we all want to do something good for kids, but we're not doing it in an aligned way. Now we're doing this work in an aligned way. Um, and, it, and it leads to a good result. I'm going to collect some cards. If you have cards, if maybe my administrator can help collect those. And I won't have time. I'm not obviously because I said I need to respect the city. <laughs> um, what we are going to do with these cards? 
is we are going to take them, and I'll answer a few, as, as many as I can right now. Obviously, I'm not going to get through all these in the next five minutes. Um, but I will, we're going to take these back. We will type every question up. We will write the answer to every question, and we will post it on our website on our strategic plan page so that it's all there, because we really do want people to know. We're not trying to keep anything secret, trust me. Um, I, I wasn't asked to do tonight. I said, hey, let me go out and do some more, and I ask administrators to be here, and I really appreciate them being here and giving up another evening to be here. Um, we want you to know. And so some of this is so detailed. If you want even more, call my assistant, Mary Davis. She'll set you up, and we'll, we'll make an appointment, and we'll talk through it. Um, what key performance indicators are you using to judge how you and your new strategic plan, how your new strategic, oh, I guess me, how I am my new strategic plan. Well, the board tells me how I'm doing um, toward the strategic plan. Um, we talked about measures, and we talked about things we want to accomplish. And so we've identified for each of those goals what would be a measure of success. So sometimes if we've, we've um, identified a role, we've written a job description, we, and we've had that board approved, and it maybe we've hired that position. Okay, that would be an indicator of success. We've gotten that person in place. Um, around assessing our students' social emotional literacy, we will have identified a partner. We will have purchased that particular tool. We will have administered that tool, and we will have the data on where our kids are, and then we'll develop a plan to assess that. So our key performance indicators in, in this first year are a lot of identifying where we are. So the, those are the kinds of things we'll look at. Um, over time, once we know where our kids are, especially on some of the social emotional, we want to see that they continue to build. We've been doing the developmental asset survey for a number of years, and that we do it every three years. The problem with that is we don't know if kids are growing in that. We know big picture data, but we don't know how individual kids are doing. And that's what we're trying to get at. And then what we hope to see is more students developing those literacies, higher rates on those things. Um, around curriculum alignment, we want to see fewer students needing reading intervention. So we implement a consistent reading program. That's part of our curriculum alignment. We want to see fewer reading intervention. We are implementing consistent response to intervention processes across our district. We want to see fewer students needing to go into the special education area because we want to get meet their needs early. Those are indicators of progress. Um, what was the IB, why was the IB program ex eliminated instead of expanded to all three elementary schools? Um, the International Baccalaureate Program is a really great program. I've been worked with it for a number of years. However, there are some components of the International Baccalaureate Program that don't align with this plan. And again, this is not the Kim Miller plan. I didn't bring this with me. This is the plan that was developed in this community. Two areas that we were specifically asked to address from our community was gifted education and special education. International Baccalaureate really doesn't promote gifted education in any kind of a pull out or separate manner nor special education. It's supposed to be included. That's not what this community said. And in fact, we kind of don't follow the ID exactly because we do those things. Um, and so we don't want to anymore align our buildings to outside agencies who tell us that we can't do things that we believe in. We want to identify the student success profile that's important for us and our kids. And then we want to look for who are the partners to help us achieve that, rather than saying, we're going to adopt an outside agency's program. So we decided not to expand it because it doesn't fit with the feedback that we received from this, along with the concept of we should be aligned. Um, so that's, that was why that decision was made. I've written a blog on this, and it's online, where I address, though, how we're keeping all of the components that we really believe in. IB is built on inquiry. I've said you, that's one of our core values. We want inquiry. We want multidisciplinary learning. We want students doing. We want a learning profile, student success profile. Those are things we just want all kids to have them, but we don't feel that we need to um, compromise on other things that we believe in as a school district. Um, at what point were teachers, administrators, and parents specifically asked to weigh in on the issue of whether the IB program should be eliminated or expanded to all schools? Essentially, I, I think I've answered that. The feedback was become aligned. Make sure you're serving our gifted students. Make sure you're serving our special needs students. So we can't do, we can't keep doing one thing and then meet these other, other needs. There also is an expenditure. We're going to spend money to educate our kids. Do we want to spend money on something that tells us not to do things we believe in? And we've decided, no, that's not a good use of our money. 
Um, are we going to continue to spend time and resources sending teachers out to IB programming professional development, which is a requirement, and you can do Jason because he had it at the middle school too, when it doesn't align to all of these other things that the community has asked for? So that's not a good expenditure of our taxpayer resources when it doesn't completely align, and we can still keep the parts of it that we love and that we want all kids to have. Um, okay, I'll do one more. I right, hamstrung by state standards requirements in making many of these changes and more of these new opportunities and creating more of these new opportunities. Um, I don't think states, I, I can look to the principals and the other administrators, I don't feel like the state standards in Ohio ham, you know, tie our hands in any way um, toward what we want to do. In fact, if you really look at standards, standards-based education is fairly open-ended. It's kind of big picture and then we get to decide within those standards how we want to approach things, what resources we want to use, what um, teaching practices we want to follow. So I don't feel like the state standards um, hurt us. Um, even assessment that some of some of us kind of get a little weary of all the state testing. Um, it really, I don't believe those things are a problem. If you want to be creative and innovative, you can be creative and innovative, and, and that's what we want to be. So it is eight o'clock, or maybe a little bit after. Again, we will write all of these up. We will put all of the answers online. If you want even more, <laughs> just call my assistant Mary Davis or send her an email and we will schedule a time for us to see. I'm working most of winter break, so that might, that's about the only time I'm not booked, but um, I will work around your schedule and find a time to meet with you if you want even more information. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for, thanks for caring about what we do as a district. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Bexley is known for supporting education. When you take a great supportive community, great staff, and resources, you are able to make a difference for each child. Bexley City Schools has a, a tremendous reputation in Central Ohio, the state of Ohio. Um, nationally, it's, uh, it's a recognized school district. Everyone like, looks out for each other and builds each other up, and it just has a strong sense of community. We have a new superintendent. We just moved like a grade to a different school. It's a great time to kind of reassess what are we doing and how do we make it even better. I've spent a year um, trying to listen and learn in order to lead the community. One of the things that the Board of Education and I discussed is our direction. And they gave me their vision that includes a more focused and unified school district. The world is changing rapidly and with some major changes in the district it made sense to, to really be thoughtful about the direction we wanted to go. Bexley City Schools needed a plan because we do so many exceptional things. We have exceptional educators, we have exceptional administrators, we have support from our parents and we do a lot of amazing things in isolation. The strategic plan gives us an opportunity to really unite and move forward as a whole. It's a game plan to allow us to come out and really engage our students, to really work with them and, uh, and be more effective in the classroom and really grow our kids. Having a strategic plan in place gives us a common direction or a point of focus. What do we want our children, when they graduate from Bexley City Schools, what life skills do we want to send them out into the world with? I truly believe that Bexley is a place that we can be a model for how public education can work effectively for each and every student. I think it comes across better to the community if it's a team effort, if it's a team plan, if the teachers are on board, if the administrators are on board, if the parents are involved, and I think even Dr. Miller had the students involved. No matter where you lived in the community, you had a voice in this process, and um, that's important. Asking for community involvement was key. We conducted focus groups with students, staff, parents, and community members, and we invited over 3,000 students, staff, parents, and community members to participate in a survey. We also held an open community meeting to, to gather final input. I think one of the most exciting things about being on the strategic planning team was the idea that we could do things in a new and innovative way. We really could listen to what people want for their children, for our children, and try and create that experience. It's not just a piece of paper, it's a collective body of information plan based on everything that everyone contributed to. So I think that is like super exciting.
The next step is to organize all of the goals and the strategies into um, a format that we can monitor our progress, um, hold ourselves accountable for implementing the strategies that will help us to achieve our objectives. So now it's finally here, I want to see everyone be supportive and find ways to, to get involved and stay involved and to help things move forward. The further we dig into this plan, the more valuable we'll see uh, as a whole district that this um, plan is really going to drive the work that we're doing. And I believe that when high expectations are placed on anyone, uh, we rise to that occasion. There is not this confusion or this disorganization, and I think that's going to help us as parents know that our kids are taken care of and going forward. So I feel like this is really helping both teachers and families connect as community members and utilize education for what its purpose really is to prepare them for the future. Each building has its own personality, which is a wonderful, unique thing for Bexley. But at the same time, we all want the end result for our children. We want them to be the highest performing or the best that they can be in who they are. And with that roadmap in place, our children, no matter which building they're in, should be able to get there. Be exceptional for me. 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 Be exceptional for me.